Teapots are one of the most difficult forms to master. They marry together so many different skills and techniques, and I still feel as if there's so much I can improve on with each new batch. This video shows their creation from beginning to end. There are dozens of steps, and I hope this film sheds some light on the process, alongside discussing some of my philosophies and ideas about the craft. All the objects I make begin their life as a lump of soft clay like this. These are individually weighed out lumps of the high iron stonework clay body I use. Each weighs approximately one and a half pounds, which is 680 grams, and these pieces will be thrown into the body of the teapot. The process you see here is called spiral wedging, and this procedure brings together the weighed out lump and removes any air pockets and makes the entire piece even and smooth in texture which is what we want when throwing on the wheel, as any textural irregularities or voids of air simply cause issues further down the line. Three of the components for my teapots are thrown. I always begin by making the bodies before moving on to the lids and finally the spouts. And even though I've wedged these lumps to be totally void of air, they still need to be centered on the wheel before the shape can be made. Centering is the first step for any pot thrown on the wheel and it's the process of coning it up and down and moving it around in such a way that it runs perfectly true beneath your hands and resides totally in the middle of the wheel. I don't want the piece of clay to undulate or wobble as those irregularities will just be exacerbated as the walls of the pot are thrown upwards. Once the clay has been centered enough, I squash it down as these are quite wide forms and I then switch to my index finger and thumb which are pushed firmly into the middle and once they've reached the correct depth, they pull outward to form the base of the teapot. I try to leave the bottom to be about half a centimetre thick, and I run my hands back and forth numerous times, as this compresses the expansive clay and can prevent things like S cracks and splits from occurring in the base. It's at this point that I make a clear distinction between the base and the walls, and I push my thumb right to the edge to create a right angle almost between the two. And once the base has been formed, I can start to pull up the walls of the pot. This is done by firmly pinching the thicker lump of clay in the base and slowly coaxing it upward. At the end of each pull, I very gently release my fingers. I then grab some water which is poured over the walls, which helps to lubricate my hands as they do the next pull. If instead I was to attempt to do this process with dry hands, then the walls of the pot would stick to them as they move upward which could potentially deform and destroy the pot. With each pull, the walls get thinner, as the thicker reserves of clay in the base of the walls are gradually distributed throughout the entirety of the walls. And as I pull, I make sure that the motion of my hands is gradual and even. I try not to drastically change the speed of the wheel or my hands as I'm working. And once I've committed to a pull starting at the bottom, I try to keep the same pressure squeezed at the start, consistent throughout the entire lift. If instead my hands would stay still for a moment or two, they end up creating a thin patch in the walls. And if there's enough weight above that thin patch, the piece can begin to buckle and twist and eventually collapse. This specific teapot design has a step around the waist. So with a finger inside, I just push out a lump and with the finger outside I help define it. And then from around the base, I scrape away the skirt of clay, which just helps to neaten up the form and removes what would otherwise be excess weight. I then use a sponge on the end of a stick to soak up the water from inside the pot, as if there's too much left inside these as they dry out overnight, it can disintegrate the base of the pot. At this point, to strengthen the form before altering the top, I remove much of the slip from the lower section this is the wet slurry you can see that covers the top of this piece. And now I can begin to collar in the top and form the rim and the opening where the lid will sit. I do this by collaring in the clay and then throwing this top section inward. I push firmly on the outside while my fingers on the inside are underneath where I'm working to support it and to prevent it from collapsing inward. I do this process gradually, bit by bit, whilst actively maintaining a certain thickness on the rim so that it provides strength to the rest of the form. It also needs to be substantial to withstand the lid being taken on and off constantly. This part can be tricky, 
and if the upper sections of the walls are initially thrown too thinly, it can be quite difficult to make an overhang like this with a defined rim like so. Once the rim has been roughly formed, I can measure it with a pair of calipers. These are set to a certain diameter and I throw all of my teapots so they have this same measured opening, which is useful as it means I can throw all of the lids to the same diameter too, instead of throwing each teapot body and lid individually. And now that the opening has been set, I can proceed to clean up the rest of the teapot form, which mostly consists of removing as much of the excess slip from the outside shape as possible. If instead I were to leave the pot covered in this slip, they would take far longer to dry, and there's even the risk of this slip degrading the clay and causing the pot to collapse. These are easily the most time consuming pieces to throw. The lids and the spouts hereafter are far more simple. The last step is to soften the rim with the chamois leather and then I can prepare to remove this part from the wheel. I begin by scraping away the excess slip on the bat, which just helps to keep things tidier. And then I use a very taut, twisted metal wire and I slide it underneath the pot. This separates it from the MDF bat the pot has been thrown on. I can then pry away this wooden platform and remove the vessel without having to touch it as it's simply carried away on this removable platform. For many other of my pieces, such as mugs and cylindrical jars, I can simply remove them with my hands, clasped directly around the pots. But with these, due to the step in their waist and their very accurately thrown opening, I really don't want to risk deforming them by removing them with my hands. Additionally, anything with an overhang like this can be tricky to remove, without some part of the overhang just sagging slightly. So when I am in doubt, I just throw them on bats, like so. I place them on the floor as there are very few drafts down on this level and ideally I want them to dry out as evenly as possible to leather hard. Next, it's time for the lids. Each of these are thrown by about 7.5 ounces, which is about 212 grams. You'll find that it's quite common with potters in the UK that they use both imperial and metric measurements when weighing out lumps of clay. For instance, a pound weight, which is 453 grams, is a really useful size for bowls, larger mugs, and other forms, and it's often easier just to refer to it as a pound weight rather than 453 grams, exactly. And it's probably worth mentioning that I don't weigh out the clay exactly to the gram when making pots. Instead, when I'm weighing out and wedging quickly, I aim for about plus or minus 10 grams around the target weight, just to speed the process up. And once again, after the clay has been weighed out, I wedge it up. And in this instance, as the lumps of clay are too small to spiral wedge, I just roll and squash them, which more or less does the same job, especially with smaller lumps of clay like this. It isn't a technique I use for wedging up larger lumps. I then take my calipers and I inverse them, whilst also adding about a millimetre or two. I much prefer throwing lids that are all just slightly too big for the jars. This way I can trim them down to fit perfectly, rather than throwing them to the exact right size and there not being any wiggle room whatsoever, as it's always much easier to remove clay at the leather hard stage than it is added. These lids are a far more simple affair, as there isn't much height in them, I can use very soft clay, which makes the centering process far quicker. I form a simple disc, which I open up, purposefully leaving the thicker outside portion, which I then separate into two parts. The piece that travels vertically will be the part that fits inside the teapot and the flatter section of clay that's horizontal will sit on top of the rim overhanging the rest of the teapot. I can then offer up my calipers to check the diameter and make any adjustments easily by pushing the locating flange either out a little bit or in if needs be. Once I'm happy with it, I remove the excess water from inside and then I can proceed to clean up all the edges with a sharp metal kidney. And at this stage I don't mind if the lids are a little bit rough. I'll be trimming these extensively once leather hard, so a few lines or pronounced maker's marks aren't a problem as they'll be very easy to tidy up when the lid is leather hard. And there's no point throwing these to be completely perfect in every way as they will be trimmed and altered quite a lot during the next stage. I chamois the top just to neaten the rim of the lid ever so slightly and remove much of the slip from the outside portion of the lid. It's then wired through and is carefully lifted away and placed alongside all the others. 
when I make teapots, I always end up throwing a few extra spouts and lids, just in case for some reason one doesn't fit, or I happen to destroy one of the components as I'm putting them together. These are the fastest component to make, although they do still need to be thrown accurately, and perhaps most importantly, the calipers must stay the same diameter throughout the process. There's nothing more annoying than them being altered ever so slightly and making a batch of lids that simply don't fit. The last thrown component for these is the spout. These are made atop what we call a hump of clay. This is when you place a large mound of clay on the wheel and only ever throw the very top portion. I designate an amount of clay within my hands to throw with, center it, and then begin to throw the spout. These are simple shapes, fundamentally, although they can be tricky to get right, as the clay is constantly collared in. Any irregularity in the clay will be exacerbated as it moves upwards, so making sure you use thoroughly wedged clay is important for this process. I find for making spouts that don't drip, I want a lip on them that's very sharp so that it can cut through the liquid rather than letting the tea simply dribble over a rounded edge. As the opening of these becomes so narrow and I can't fit a finger inside, I instead use a wooden dowel to push the clay up against. Once I feel like the spout is long enough and the inside surface isn't too rough, I use a metal kidney to scrape away the excess slip on the outside and I simply let the curve of the tool dictate the shape of the spout and this makes throwing these in repetition quite easy as the profile of the tool simply acts as a guide for the shape. I then very delicately use a chamois just to soften the top edge and to ensure that it's even all the way around. And then I use a planted turning tool to create an undercut towards the base of the piece and it's through this groove that I can easily drag the wire, slicing and removing it from the hump of clay below. It's then very carefully lifted away and set aside with the others. And now that all of the components have been thrown, I'll carefully let them dry out until they're all perfectly leather hard so they can be trimmed and assembled. Teapots need to be able to do a number of things. First and foremost, they need to be able to hold tea, obviously. They need to pour well without dribbling too much from the spout. You need to be able to hold them and pour them with ease without burning your fingers because the handle's too close to the teapot body and the lid needs to stay in place during this process without rattling or easily falling off. And they need to do all of this while remaining aesthetically pleasing and with components that match one another proportionally. And while that all sounds complicated enough, juggling all of the components so they're at the perfect condition for assemblage is another whole challenge in itself. And that's what I'm doing here with these pieces. They've spent the night drying out, but some parts that are perhaps more thickly potted are still a bit soft and need more time before they can be trimmed. So I flip all the lids upside down so their thicker tops can dry out in the air more quickly. And this challenge of managing work, controlling how quickly the different pieces dry out, is so critical to the process. And it's also one that's so fundamentally different in every studio around the world. The climate you live in, the type of clay, if there are any drafts in your studio, heating, if the kilns have been on, and even just the condition you left the pots in when removing them from the wheel, will all make a difference in how quickly they dry out and how they dry out too. It isn't a process you want to rush, and the way it's done will change from potter to potter, and it's something that can only really be learned through experience. Now that all my different components are drying out, I spend some time cleaning up all the bats and the studio too, or simply throw and trim other pots that I'm currently working on. And once the pieces are completely leather hard, it's time to trim. As I throw my lids to be a little bit too large so that I can trim them down perfectly, the first thing I do is trim the locating flange of the lid so that it slots into the teapot's body perfectly. I tap center the lid so that it spins in the very middle of the wheel and then I secure it in place with three soft bits of clay, positioned around it like the points of a triangle. I then begin to trim clay away from the vertical flange, just from this outside section initially, and then to check, I can simply lower the teapot body onto it, and if it doesn't fit, I know I need to remove just a touch more. And once it slots over nicely, with just a touch of wiggle room, perhaps half a millimetre or so, I begin to trim the interior portion of the lid. And this is mostly just to refine the interior form and to remove a bit of the excess weight. 
There are numerous ways of making lids, but part of what keeps this particular design held in place as the teapot pours is how well it fits and the weight of the lid itself. After enough clay has been turned away, I can remove the lid and begin to work the body. I keep this part held down in a slightly different way. I brush some slip around the base and then place it on the wheel and rub it back and forth a number of times. The friction in combination with the slip quickly drying creates a really very sturdy seal between the two parts and it means I can trim the entirety of the walls without any lumps of clay getting in the way or mechanical restraining arms. And lastly I just blend in the bottom portion of the pot to create an additional seal to hold it in place. And now the trimming can start. I'm using sharp tools with tungsten carbide blades that really bite and slice through the abrasive clay. And during this process I'm removing both the excess weight and I'm also neatening up the form considerably. I want the pots to be light when picked up, especially as these are teapots. If they were thickly potted and filled with tea, they can end up being very heavy at the end. So I trim a lot away from the walls, so they're about 3 or 4 millimeters thick. And it's at this point that I really define the ledge that surrounds the waist of the pot. I use different trimming tools for different jobs, smaller ones for the more delicate areas, and larger, sharper blades when I just want to remove material. My turning tools are held incredibly firmly throughout this process, and I lean my upper body weight onto my right arm to add stability to my movement. Once the walls on the side have been trimmed, I skim over them with a flat edged metal tool to soften the marks left from trimming. And you might notice that I don't trim the top of the pot just yet. In fact, I do it after turning the lid, as I push down with quite a lot of pressure during this process. If the shoulder and rim section have already been turned, then the procedure of trimming the lid can sometimes cause the shoulder section to slump downward. So I always do it afterwards. The lid is relatively simple to trim, as it's held so securely by the teapot body below, as if it were a specially made chuck. To keep the lid from jumping up, I apply constant downward pressure with my left hand, and you'll see that as I work, I often join my two thumbs together, bracing them, and once again adding stability to the process. One of my ideas for this form was to have three distinct lines that cut through the glaze on the lid, the shoulder, and then around the waist. The sharp edges I trim will cut through the green glaze that's coated over these, which adds interest to what would otherwise be quite a plain and simple shape. The top of the lid itself is trimmed to have a slight hollow in it. This is so the glaze can pull thickly into it, as the thicker the crackle celadon type glaze is, the more interesting it'll look. Once the top has been burnished smooth, I then pierce a hole through the lid, and this serves a very important function as it allows air to be pulled through the vessel as the tea is poured out. Without the hole, as the tea is poured, the liquid would glug as it exits the spout, instead of pouring in a nice even stream, which this footage here demonstrates nicely. And this becomes even more critical when you have lids that fit very tightly, as there's simply no gaps for the air to sneak through otherwise. The lid is flipped over, and the exit wound from the pierced hole is cleaned up. And now that the lid has been finished, it's at this point that I'll tidy up the shoulder and rim of the teapot body, which only takes a moment, and it's a very easy place to trim, as I can place my fingers inside the vessel and judge the thickness opposite of where I'm turning. To remove the teapot, I scrape away the seal at the bottom and slide a knife beneath the pot. I then scrape away any excess left on the wheel head as I'll then be placing the teapot upside down supported on the lid, which now neatly acts as a chuck for the teapot body. And just like before, I can secure it in place with three soft lumps of clay. There can be a tendency for the teapot body to move around somewhat as I trim it. And as the expanse of clay is so wide and relatively thin, if I were to push down directly on the clay, there's a chance I could bow the base inward. So by using this nylon spinner, it helps to distribute the weight. Think of it like lying down on thin ice, as opposed to standing upright with all the pressure focused on one spot. For the bases of these, I simply trim them to be as flat as they can be. 
where I surround the circumference, I bevel the edge. This creates a point of contact with whichever surface it's placed on that's less likely to chip, and it also causes the pot to cast a tiny black shadow beneath itself, which makes it appear as if it's hovering ever so slightly, and prevents the form from looking as if it just sinks into whatever surface it's placed upon. The final step for this part is to stamp in my maker's mark. Think of this as my signature, it's how people can identify which pots I've made. Mine is just a simple little F for obvious reasons, but I like to think that its runic appearance links nicely back to my Anglo-Saxon heritage. The next part of the process is joining the spout to the body of the teapot. I slice it through at this angle with the twisted metal wire and then carve out some of that excess clay from inside the spout. I then take a tapering wetted sponge on a stick and insert it inside and rotate it. This smooths the marks left from the knife but it does leave a somewhat rough surface as the sponge fettles away the clay that surrounds specks of sand. So after I've sponged it clean, I then use my finger to compress and burnish the interior of the spout. I also leave the walls to be purposefully thick around the outside of the spout, so there's enough material that I can easily blend it into the body with. In terms of spout placement, there are a number of things to consider. The tip of the spout should more or less be in line with the opening of the teapot. If instead it's placed too low on the form, then you'll only be able to fill the teapot up to a certain level before it gushes out of the spout, rendering a huge portion of the internal capacity useless. And finally there's the angle at which the spout protrudes. If it's attached horizontally, like so, then the liquid won't flow out with much strength. Instead the spout really should point upwards slightly. And this, in combination with a spout that has a sharp lip and enough holes from the body leading into it, should ensure that it pours quite nicely. I gently push the spout onto the area I want it to be, and then I score around it with a sharp potter's needle, so that when it's removed, I know the area in which the holes will need to be drilled in. I then use a hole punch to pierce out a number of holes, and I do so at a slight downward angle, just so they more closely match the direction of flow of the liquid. As I pierce these holes, I keep one finger inside the vessel bracing the thin wall of the pot. If I were to do this without it, there's a good chance I would simply deform this section of the wall, or a crack might occur on one of the thin bits of clay that separates the holes. I then scrape away the worst of the burrs on the outside and then blow a strong gust of air through them to clear any debris stuck inside. I then take the tapering end of my potter's needle, place it into each hole and rotate it slightly, which neatens the holes up. Then, using the same potter's needle, I score all the way around the holes to create a rough surface, which helps the spout to join to it more securely. You could use a wider serrated kidney to do this, but I prefer the accuracy I can achieve with a needle. I then take the spout and partly submerge it in water for a few minutes. I then also brush some slip over the scored area on the teapot. This will cause the clay here to soften slightly. And in conjunction with the clay of the spout which is softening in the water, it makes joining the two components together quite straightforward, and I rarely have any cracks forming. Another benefit of soaking the spout like this is as it softens the clay, it makes it very easy to blend into the teapot's body. I begin by placing it on lightly, and then really check and double check that it's attached at the right angle, and that it's perfectly in line with the holes pierced inside. And then the relatively slow process of blending it into the body can begin. It might look as if I can't see what I'm doing as I'm working here, but opposite of where I sit, on the left hand side here, is a mirror, which is used extensively throughout this process, but more so for when I'm throwing and trimming pots on the wheel. I begin by blending in the clay of the spout into the teapot body all the way around. And in those areas which can be difficult to reach, I just use a metal rod, and again I go all the way around with this, compressing the clay and really making sure that both parts are joined together firmly. 
Then I switch back to the sponge on a stick to fettle and really blend the two parts together. This is what creates a really seamless join, although it does create a rough surface as the sponge easily wipes away the clay but leaves the specks of sand present in the clay itself. So after I've sponged all the way around, I go over these areas once again, just with a wetted finger, to compress those specks of sand back into the clay body. This part takes time, but for the overall look of the teapot, I think it's really necessary. Although it can be difficult in this instance to create such a smooth blend without interrupting the line around the waist and the line above the spout around the shoulder. And now the spout has been attached, it's time to move on to the final component for the teapot, which is pulling its handle. I begin with a simple block of clay, which is held aloft in my left hand, as my right hand bathes it in water, grips it near the top by my fingers of my left hand and pulls it downward. This is repeated time and time again, and gradually the length of clay gets longer and thinner. And just like when I'm shaping the walls of a pot on the wheel at the throwing stage, if I don't use water as a lubricant, my hand will stick to the clay and I'll rip the entire length away. So I constantly use water and I apply an even pressure from the top of the length to the bottom. And what I'm making are handle blanks. These aren't the final finished handles, rather they're pieces of clay which I'll be able to attach to the teapots and pull again into shape. But before I do that, I snip each one of them off against the edge of a table. At this stage, I don't mind if they touch one another or if there are fingerprints on them, as each is going to be changed considerably from this state. You might wonder why I don't use an extruder to do this process, and there are numerous reasons as to why not. This method is really fast, especially with practice, and it's also very easy to quickly adjust the shape and size of the handle blanks just by changing the profile of my hand which is pulling them. Whereas with an extruder, every time I want to change the size of handle, I need to change the die plate in the bottom of the machine, which means the machine needs to be cleaned out, the die changed, and more clay inserted inside. And finally, there's the cleanup. Tidying an extruder is perhaps one of the dullest jobs there is. Whereas when pulling like this, there's pretty much nothing to clean up, other than a few drops of slip on the table. I want these handle blanks to remain soft, for the same reason I wanted part of the spout to be soft. When the clay is malleable, it's much easier to blend into the body of the teapot. So I wrap the blanks up in plastic, and even spray them with water, that way they don't dry out whatsoever after being pulled. It does mean that they need to be worked quite delicately when being pulled with finesse on the teapot, but I find when they're soft it's much easier to achieve a nice shape, and as long as you're able to control it, the clay moves with your hand with far more ease. Whereas attempting this handling method with a handle blank that's leather hard would be practically impossible. So I take one of the blanks and I tap out one end. This creates a flare of clay which I'll easily be able to blend into the body of the teapot without having to steal material from the length itself which would create a thin spot in the join. I then use a serrated kidney to score an area that's directly opposite the spout. The two parts really need to be in line so I crouch down and line them up, and then dab some slip onto the scored area. I then take the handle blank, and I really firmly push it onto the scored section. And once again, there's a hand inside the vessel, which braces the pressure from the inside, preventing the handle from deforming the wall as it pushes inward. I then follow up with a dry fingertip that blends in the clay from the tapped out end of the handle all the way around. This join has to be very secure, as the next stage, when I pull it finer and thinner, can put a lot of strain on the join itself, and if it isn't done sufficiently well enough, there's a good chance the handle will just be torn away from the teapot. With my left hand, I then pick the teapot up, and much like I did before, I hold the teapot up with my left hand, whilst my right hand continues to pull the handle ever thinner and finer. Every few pulls, I change the position of my right hand, so the groove of skin between my index finger and my thumb is pulled across both the left and right hand sides of the handle, which ensures the profile is the same either side. And as I pull the handle, I angle it upwards slightly so that it matches the angle at which the spout springs from the teapot, so there's some sort of symmetry between the two components. 
once the length is roughly as long and thin as I want it. I then use the tip of my thumb on my right hand to pull in three distinct grooves into the back of the handle. This thins it out just a touch more and also creates three interesting areas the glazes can pull in, in a similar way to how the top of the lid does. The grooves also aid how ergonomic the handle is, as when the teapot's being held and used, your own thumb will naturally come to rest in the groove left in the back of the handle. I then make any small final adjustments before grasping the handle at one end and carefully arching it into place. I firmly press the handle into the lower section of the teapot's body, pinch off any excess, and then blend the join very neatly into the body whilst double checking it's in line with the spout. I want the handle to look as if it's grown naturally from the teapot, springing from the top and flowing back into the body lower down, as opposed to it just looking as if it's been stuck on roughly. This isn't to say it's the only way it should be done. Perhaps the greatest joy of ceramics is the myriad of ways all these different processes can be done. Each potter tends to develop their own ways of making pots and pulling handles, and thank goodness that's the case as otherwise everyone would be making the same pots. Once I've blended the join neatly, I use a wetted finger just to smooth over the area and hide any of the more prominent smudges from attaching it. And at long last, that's the teapot assembled, but by no means is that the end of the process yet. I then place the teapots upside down overnight, as the handles are still soft if they were left the other way around, there's a chance the thinly pulled clay could sag and the handles would lose their shape. The pieces are kept wrapped up tightly overnight and this prevents them from drying out too quickly. If instead I left them uncovered overnight, there's a high chance that cracks would develop around the spout and around the joints of the handle. So wrapping them up and even spraying them with a touch of water for even numerous days is very helpful. The teapots are then place back on the wheel and it's at this point that I do a final bit of quality control, which in this case included carving away a bit of the excess clay on the underside of the handle, just to make the flow and the overall look of the handle better. And once again on those worked areas, I just use a sponge and a stick to soften them and then just compress the clay with my fingertips, just to compress any specks of sand. The teapot is then carefully placed upside down and the base is double checked and cleaned up. During the handling process, when the teapot is laid down onto the workbench, there's a chance the flat leather hard bottoms of these could be scratched a tiny bit or a piece of dirt or clay could embed itself back into the soft clay. So the last thing I do is check the base and burnish any edges that need it. And now, finally, at long last, the actual clay work of the teapot is finished, but these still need to be bisque fired, glazed, and reduction fired in my gas kiln before they can finally be called finished and ready to use. I then let these pots dry out slowly under plastic for a couple of days before uncovering them properly and letting them turn bone dry, which is the state pots are called when all the moisture has left them. And as this happens, this red colored clay changes to a lighter pink tone and it's also at that point that these pots are at their most fragile, which means throughout the next process, as they're loaded into the electric kiln to be bisque fired to 1000 degrees Celsius, you need to be very careful about how you handle them. This is my Rhoda TE200 electric kiln. When it isn't used, I roll it back into the corner of the room, but when I do fire it up, I just pull it out to give it a bit more space. In this firing, the pots can touch one another, as the kiln doesn't fire hot enough for the pots to become sticky and weld to each other. So with these firings, to make them as cost efficient as possible, I really pack them as densely as I possibly can. And I do need to be very careful when doing this, as it's incredibly easy to chip the fine edges of these pots. This kiln is heated by the elements you can see embedded in the brick walls. Think of it sort of like being a giant toaster with a lid on top and elements that are far more powerful and over a firing cycle that lasts about 10 hours, they're taken from ambient room temperature to 1000 degrees Celsius. And this changes what is a very brittle and fragile material into one that's far stronger and is also slightly absorbent, like a sponge, which is a necessary trait, as it's that which will allow them to pull in the water the glaze contains, leaving a powdery layer of the raw materials on the outside of the pot. A few days later, once the kiln has fired and cooled down, 
the pots can be unpacked and you'll notice they're a slightly more vibrant pink hue at this stage. And whilst they are much stronger than before, they are still relatively fragile. If I were just to squeeze one of these pieces too firmly, it could cause it to crack. So all the pots are unpacked and set aside, and then the next stage can begin, which is the waxing of these pieces. This is a very simple wax emulsion, which I brush onto the areas of the pots, which I don't want the glaze to adhere onto. It's as simple as a wax resist, and as these areas are covered, the glaze simply can't be absorbed into these portions. So I wax the underside of the lid, and then for the teapot body itself, I wax both the rim and a little bit inside, and the base. I mix my wax emulsion with a touch of boiling water, just to make it brush on a bit more smoothly. And I brush a tiny bit just beneath the rim on the inside, just so the flange on the underside of the lid that goes inside the teapot doesn't end up sticking to this part piece is then flipped over once the wax on the rim is dry and a layer of wax is brushed over the bottom. This stuff just burns away during the firing. You'd never even know it was there, but it means I have to do far less cleaning up later on after the pot has been glazed. And lastly, I just dab an extra bit of wax into my maker's mark just to ensure that it's properly covered, as it can be a little tricky to clean out perfectly if left uncovered. After all of the pots have been waxed, and usually this doesn't just include the teapots, but hundreds of bowls and mugs, jars, ink dip pens, ink wells, all manner of things. But after everything has been waxed, it's time to begin the glazing. I'll be glazing these pieces with a felspathic crackle glaze, which is coloured by 2% red iron oxide. And once reduction fired, will turn a deep, dark green colour. And that's one thing you quickly learn as a potter, is that glazes at this stage often don't look anything like how they'll appear once fired. But first, as I haven't used this glaze for a while, I need to give it a really thorough mix. It's all the raw materials this glaze contains, such as felspar, nephilim cyanite, china clay and red iron oxide, have settled to the bottom. Before dipping the teapots in the glaze, I purposely saturate some portions of the teapot, just with water, so that these particular areas don't draw in a thick layer of glaze. And these holes in particular are certainly one of the areas I don't want to be blocked. So I submerge the pot for five or six seconds, then carefully remove it, letting the excess drain out through the holes and through the spout. And I blow gently through the spout, just to make sure they're clear. The water really is just a means of transport. As it's absorbed into the clay body, a layer of the raw materials are left on the outside of the pot. It can be especially difficult to glaze a teapot neatly without any drips on the outside surface, but I'll be able to clean those up later. I then use a needle to carefully place a water droplet within the hole on the teapot lid, once again to saturate that area so it doesn't absorb too much glaze. I then pull it out and hold it in such a way that the excess glaze can pool on the top of the lid. It dries quickly, so I can take it with my other hand and place it on the teapot. And then once all of them have been glazed, I'll set them aside so that they can slowly dry out. And the surface will go from being quite tacky and difficult to tidy up, to incredibly soft and powdery and much easier to clean. This process usually begins the following day, after the pots have been given enough time to dry out. And for the most part, I can just use my fingertips to rub down any larger drips or the marks left by the tongs that were used to dip them. But first, I carefully carve out any glaze that's left in the hole on the lid. And then I use a soaked sponge to fettle all the way around where the glaze meets the clay to make as perfect a line as possible. The entire time I work over a basin of water, which collects any dust that falls down and eventually this glaze can be recycled and sieved back into my larger buckets, so there really is very little waste. And it's this part, I think, the careful sponging, that really makes the biggest difference to the end product, as if I didn't spend time carefully sponging these lines clean, they'd really be quite rugged and unprofessional once fired. After the lid's been done, I can move on to cleaning up the teapot body, which takes a bit longer. I use a rather blunted paring knife, 
just to carve away the more dramatic droplets. And whilst I'm doing this, I need to be careful not to dig too deep, as if I do make a thin patch, it'll be visible once fired as a sort of brown metallic patch. You can clearly see here the area the wax resisted on the base of the teapot, and although it isn't perfect, and some specks of glaze have settled on the surface, it's still easier just to wipe away a few specks rather than sponging away a thick layer of glaze. After all of the droplets have been removed, I then go over the surface just with my fingers, smoothing over the remnants of the drips, and also going over any of the more prominent pinholes which you can see scattered across the surface. The excess dust I wipe away simply fills these back up, and then I can move on to sponge and clean the base, which is a relatively fast process, and the trimmed beveled edge around the circumference sort of acts as a guide on which I can glide the sponge all the way around. And then lastly I just make sure there are no droplets left, as if there is glaze left on the base, during the firing it can stick the pot to the kiln shelf. And then, to tidy up the rim, I take the pot back to the wheel, centre it, and then use a wet sponge to wipe away the glaze on the rim, and just beneath it on the inside too. I used to do this process by hand, but I found I can get much cleaner lines when doing it on the wheel, especially for such a delicate and fine area like this. I need this portion of the teapot's rim to remain bare, as I'll be firing both the teapot body and the lid together, with small discs of wadding separating them. Wadding is a highly refractory material, which I mix up from 50% china clay and 50% coarse alumina hydrate. I mix it with water into a clay-like consistency, and then I roll it out and slice it into individual lumps like this, which I press into discs and carefully position around the lid. They easily stick onto the wax surface with just a touch of pressure, and as long as they're only touching the regions of bare clay, they won't stick to the glaze. The lid is then carefully lowered onto the body and placed in such a way that neither part are touching one another, apart from the waddings separating them. Firing the two components saves a lot of space in the kiln, and it also ensures that the two will match one another. Next, all the pots are carefully loaded into my gas kiln, which is a Rhoda KG340, which is fueled with natural gas. This kiln is packed in such a way that none of the pots are touching, as if they do happen to make contact. The glazes melt into a sticky glass and fuse to each other, so I'm much more careful about how I pack this. Being able to fire with a gas kiln means that you can fire in a reduction atmosphere, which opens up a whole new realm of colours and surfaces, which you just can't quite replicate in an electric kiln. Inside each kiln load, I can usually fit about 150 to 170 pots, depending on their size, and whilst packing it only takes an hour or two at most. Firing it up to 1290 degrees Celsius, which is about 2354 degrees Fahrenheit or cone 10 for the potter's watching, takes about 9 hours from lighting the kiln to turning it off. Those three spiky objects you can see are called pyrometric cones. During the firing these melt and slump over in the direction they're facing, and they measure heat work, which is heat over time. And these are my targets, really. I can look at them through the spy holes in the kiln's door during the firing. And once all three have bent over, I know it's time to turn the kiln off, as it means that not only has the correct temperature been reached, but the pots have also been held at that specific temperature for long enough. The kiln is lit, with the door open purposefully, as doing so prevents the gas from accumulating in a closed off chamber, and then being ignited, which as you can probably guess, would cause quite a dramatic explosion. The door is then tightly sealed, and the firing can commence. I usually light the kiln at about 7am sharp, and for the first couple of hours I let it just gradually heat up, as I don't want to rush the process, and doing so can actually cause pots, if they are a little bit damp, to explode. There are four burners for this kiln, and alongside the gas there's also some forced air provided by an air compressor. The two are gradually increased together and the entire process is manual, but that doesn't mean I have to spend the entire day watching the kiln and its dials. Instead I check it every half hour and adjust it accordingly. At 860 degrees precisely, I initiate reduction. I do this by increasing the gas pressure to 10 m bar and the air pressure to 0.4 bar, as well as sliding over the dampers halfway across the exit flues on the back. This causes the internal atmosphere to burn with insufficient oxygen, and as a result, the burning gas inside, which is seeking oxygen, 
it can strip away oxygen molecules from iron molecules inside the clay and the glazes, thus changing their colours to the characteristic blues and greens that my glazes have. If instead I fired these glazes in an oxidised atmosphere, they would appear yellow. As the temperature increases, I gradually open the dampers on the back, only by tiny increments, and then, finally, once it's the correct temperature, the gas can be turned off and the firing's over. These are the spy holes I look through during the firing, and once the kiln has been turned off, I remove both of the bungs from the spy holes and fully open the dampers to let the kiln crash cool back to 1000 degrees Celsius before closing it up properly and letting it cool slowly for another 36 hours or so. And now finally, the kiln is ready to open. This is always quite an anxiety inducing moment, as whilst I know what's happening inside, you can never see it really during the firing, and it's only once you crack the door open and get your first glimpse at the pots that you know everything went according to plan or not. I usually open the kiln when it's about 150 degrees or so, and at this temperature the pots ping and create a cacophony of sound as their glassy surfaces release tension and contract over the clay body. The kiln is then carefully unpacked and each pot inspected. There's always a wealth of information to gather from each firing, as well as some surprises, usually. I label each cone pack and place it above the kiln and continue unloading all of the pots. They aren't finished yet though, not quite, as all of the pots need to have their bases sanded and all of the lidded vessels need to have their waddings removed and the lids ground smooth into place. To smooth their bases, I simply submerge some wet and dry sandpaper and rub them back and forth a number of times. I'm not trying to sand them to be glassy smooth, rather I'm simply trying to remove any sharp specks of sand which can sometimes be there as the clay has receded around them. The lids can then be carefully cracked off and the woodings removed. In most cases they either fall off themselves, but sometimes they can stick a tiny amount to the iron that bleeds out from the clay body, so in those cases I carefully pry them away just with a potter's needle. Then, as the exposed clay body is relatively rough, I smear over some valve grinding paste onto the bare clay and rub the lid and the teapot body together. And then I spend about 5-10 to ten minutes grinding each until the really harsh gritty sound is no longer there. This process really eats up time, especially when there are dozens of pots to do, but it makes a world of difference. And it can also save some pots in some cases, say if the lid just doesn't quite fit, the carborundum paste will grind away the irregularity that's causing it to not fit properly. The paste is then washed off with hot soapy water and at long last the teapot is finished. And with that there's only one thing left to do, which is make a pot of tea and test it. Thanks so much for watching, if you've made it all the way through. This video contains months of work and footage, as in reality the process of making pottery is long and arduous, so I hope this film sheds some light on what is quite a complicated procedure from start to finish. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.